We are back in the studio in a multiple part conversation. My good friend and guest, we've been calling each other bros now uh, since having some time in town, John Bradshaw, who I've always thought wrote some of the best books and was very influential in changing the whole recovery, addiction, family dysfunction scenarios. And I had the good fortune of being with John in a meditation at, at John Denver's Windstar Foundation with about 2,000 people with their handkerchiefs out after about uh, 20 minutes into the meditation. So it's stuck in my mind a long time. And uh, of course, yours truly, Alan Hutner, here with John, doing uh, both radio and YouTube if you're seeing it on television. John, I want to come back to the conversation about the trolley and this study about uh, if somebody's obscure and you don't know them, it's easy to say, well, we need to have that person killed to save many lives. Um, you, you referenced off mic some kind of brain study, why people do this. You want to speak about that? They did a study at Yale with their graduate students, and they, they gave them the same dilemma. And they noticed that it was the non-dominant hemisphere of the brain that was lighting up when people were saying, no, you can't push another person. It's more, uh, in my opinion, I can't give you an exact explanation of it, but it's more that the non-dominant hemisphere is the seat of the soul, you might say. There's, there's something, it's felt thought, it's mm -hmm. gut level. Mm -hmm. Whereas this other, as they looked at the brains of these graduate students, was the right was in, was the left hemisphere it was more the logical brain, you know they, they 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 said okay well logically, but somehow when you brought a human being into it, when you brought in the idea of throwing somebody on the track and mm -hmm. killing them, yeah, they 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 found that repulsive. Yeah, no, no no rights or wrongs. We're just trying to understand how people perceive what's virtuous or not. Totally. Yeah. And one of the if I if the, when the paperback comes out on this book, the part of the, the subtitle is going to be the missing link in moral education, mm -hmm. because I as I began to write this book, I went back to a course I had done in Aristotle, a sixth book of the Ethics, and it was uh, Aristotle breaking with Plato and Socrates. And what that meant was that Socrates had said, um, Plato had given the example of a, of a guy who, who, who found a pair of glasses that made him invisible. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, now this guy uh, could do anything he wants to. But he said that, Plato says he won't. If he knows the consequences, say, of coming into your house and stealing from you and your wife, he wouldn't do it. And it's what a lot of us call the Socratic fallacy that, uh, you know, come on, I'm not going with that one. Uh -huh. But what Aristotle picked up on was, was two earlier philosophers, Democritus, who said there are those who know who've never learned. And, and in that book, Aristotle said over and over again, what would you rather, would you rather know what justice is or be just? Mm -hmm. And his whole thing was that virtue is practical knowledge, but it's felt thought. It's more... Uh, what somebody's called co-natural knowledge. Mm -hmm. It's gut level stuff. So in effect, John, you're saying if somebody um, hasn't been able to access their feeling self, or you call it affect later in the book, which is very important, um, th that capacity to not feel can end up having them act in very non-virtuous ways or in, in, in malicious ways or in violent criminal ways. Totally. Uh, uh -huh. One of the things this book is against is what I call cultures of obedience uh -huh. or totalistic systems. I was on Oprah. The last time I was on there was with a woman, 55 years old, and just found out that her father, her dear, wonderful papa, who used to say grace before meal, had a, was the head of a small concentration camp and probably had killed 500,000 people. Uh -huh. and, and so her question was, how can you do that? And my answer was, you can do anything if you can't feel. And the whole German pedagogy was corporal punishment, shaming, and the repression of emotion. And see, it's the same thing with addiction and in the recovery field. All of us who had to, who got shamed, and and my family, don't be so emotional. Uh, emotions are weak. Uh, absolutely, we have just thrown emotions out. And without emotion, you cannot be a moral person, a fully moral person. 
That's what this book is arguing. So that the missing link is how many of us went to Sunday school and had them uh, working on naming our, our affects or expressing our emotions or validating each other's feelings. Because when you grow up with this feelings are weak and men shouldn't feel and all of that kind of stuff, uh, and it was not until 1965 that a guy named Sylvan Tompkins came out with a book uh, that where he, he said that we have nine innate affects, that when you name these affects, they're feelings, and that we have an affect system that is actually the primary motivator of all human behavior. So it was replace, replacing Freud's libido theory, pleasure theory, hunger theory, that emotion, if, 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 if you can't feel, nothing matters. Yeah. You had that, uh, this was in the, uh, in the teaching that you did the other day at the uh, USJT conference with the circle about words and our senses and all the feelings, too. Right. Because we don't understand the languaging, necessarily, of what conceptually and what is a thought, felt, smelt, seen, heard related to a word. Absolutely. I was giving an example of, of being in an AA meeting and a guy is crying and I asked him what was the matter and he said Muffy died and I didn't know who the hell Muffy was and I suddenly found out Muffy was his dog and I thought that was crazy because yeah. I had never had a dog and uh, later, about a year later, I bought my son a dog and when I'd come in the house, that dog would jump up and pee on himself when he saw me, something I'd always wanted someone to do, you know, and it was like, and he'd, I'd go in out the back door and come in. And, and so, in other words, I now had the sensory experience to go with the word or the phrase, Muffy died or my dog died. Yeah. You told a, another funnier story. I'd, I'd like you to go to that one about the honeymoon couple. Oh, well, that's a little bit rough. But anyway, this <laughs> this couple had committed to be celibate. He had come from a family like mine where there were no genitals. No one ever talked about anything. She had come from a family where they just talked freely. So they're in foreplay. And at one point she says, darling, touch my puka. <laughs> well, he doesn't know what a puka is. And he's never talked about this stuff, yeah. so he's not about to ask her. And so he goes for something, and it's wrong. And uh, and so and then I had another guy that came in one time was talking about his Billy Ray Dill, and I'm trying to take notes. And uh, and, and so my my thing I come out of that with we should stand on the altar and say these are my tatas, this is my dodo, this because people have all these funny little names yeah. for things. Yeah. And, and, and this guy, how did he expect his wife to know? Because uh, he wouldn't ask her. Yeah. And the point being that probably many of the words that we hold in, in our brain-mind complex have different uh, perceptions attached to it. And this is where good communication comes in. Totally. Mil yeah. Milton Erickson, the great therapist in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, used to say at the beginning of a training, don't believe that you understand one word that the person is saying to you mm -hmm. without you know like, like a woman comes in to me i'm the uh director of human research she says I, this company sucks <laughs> well what does that mean i mean i had been passed over for stock options i thought it sucked too but my job is to find out what she means by it yeah and i finally find out it's it's management but there was 37 managers i finally found out it's mr hansen uh, and I said, well, what is it about him? Like, well, he's arrogant. Well, you see, all I do with that is I go to my experience of arrogant. Mm -hmm. I don't know what her experience of arrogant is. I said, how specifically is he arrogant? Well, he didn't. I got on the elevator this morning. He didn't talk to me. Now I know I have a picture of this company sucks. Yeah. All right. John Bradshaw with us in the studio here. We're having some fun together uh, talking about his new book, Reclaiming Virtue. Uh, however, we take great latitude in telling other stories and circulating around it. We'll get back into the book after this, uh, a series with John.